Hi, everyone. Welcome to Humane Voices, the official podcast of the Humane Society of the United States. Carrie and Austin here. If you've been itching to get your cat fix on the show, you're in luck today. We're sitting down with our returning guest, one of our resident cat experts, Danielle Bays, who is a senior analyst for cat protection and policy for the HSUS. Danielle, we've missed you. Welcome on back. Well, thank you. I'm so glad to be here. I'm personally Absolutely. loving the fact that you suggested that this is for people who are itching to talk about cats because that's us, Austin, since we're allergic. We're itching like to it? talk as we talk about cats. <laughs> I tried Literally. to bring that in there. Yeah, I'm like... <laughs> I see what yeah. you did there. Yeah, yeah thank you. I, I appreciate uh, the, the, the pun recognition there. But uh, yeah, so the topic for today, Danielle, is indoor and outdoor cats. The last time we were talking a little bit about it before the episode, the last time we had you on... In 2019, which is crazy, we talked about the DC, pandemic ago, right? Mm-hmm. A whole pandemic ago. It seemed like yesterday and also 20 years ago. Uh, but yeah, we talked about the DC cat count, which is a huge project trying to count cats. Um, the project just wrapped up, so we thought it would be a good time to bring you back on the show, talk about that project, talk about indoor and outdoor cats in general, stray cats, and everything that goes within that. So um, the first question, of course, the most important one, how many jokes about hurting cats have you received from this project? I think that's what all the listeners want to know first. I don't know how many I've received. I probably should have tracked how many I've made. (laughs) I did actually make one earlier today. Yeah, perfect. I was emailing with my vet, my veterinarian asking for his support on a policy issue. And I did make a hurting cats reference. So yeah, it's, um, I, I don't track cat jokes anymore because they're just part of my lexicon. Uh, yeah. I would just set up an automatic delete button. <laughs> like <laughs> if, if a hurting cat joke enters your inbox, it goes to the trash. Right. Yay. Yeah. Exactly. Problem solved. Auto delete. Thank you. Outlook. Um, oh. yeah. So no, but, uh, yeah, the, the DC cat count, Danielle, uh, it just wrapped up. What inspired it in the first place? And what did we learn from this project? Ooh, you know, one of the, the challenges we've always had with, with cats, especially outdoor cats, is data and actually good numbers of how many cats there are, how that population changes, how we figure out what that population is. Because it's like, it's hurting cats is hard. So we yeah. can hurt them, but we can like observe them. And then from that observation, what do we know? So that's what we were trying to figure out. We're really the DC cat count was a research project using DC as our laboratory. Think mm. of how, what tools can we develop and what can be scientifically valid estimates of cat populations and how those populations change. And we know that they have the same thing that they're dealing with wildlife. It's like, mm-hmm. we don't, you know, it's not a census of birds. They don't line up and you check off all the boxes, right? You base it on what you observe. So it was a really great opportunity for animal welfare folks to partner with folks in the conservation field. And these are are groups of people that are often portrayed in the media as like, you know, Bugs Bunny Roadrunner kind of <laughs> Lester Tweedy. Like these are like yeah. mortal enemies, like those kind of um opposites, but really we're not because we're interested in learning the same thing. So we can use these techniques. So we're applying all of these things that had been used um, in for different species to cats in a more urban environment. So it was just really interesting um, to use um, like motion activated cameras, as well as what we call transects walks, where you're just walking a predetermined path and you look to see what cats you happen to see at that time. And how does that relate to how many cats there are? Because you know, you're not seeing any of them. What's like the detectability? Mm -hmm. So a whole bunch. Um, But we also looked at the shelter data. Um, And one of the reasons that DC was a great laboratory is that there's one animal shelter here that has the animal control contract. It runs the community cat program. It has the spay neuter clinic. It was like in-house, everything, all the data was right there. Mm -hmm. So look at where are the cats coming from the shelter and where are they going? Uh, but when we also asked people, we did surveys of um, people in the community, like, do you feed cats? Do you have cats? Do your cats go in and out? And got a lot of information directly from them. Um, and none of that has been done in the same area at the same time before. 
Um, mm. There have been, been studies of uh, outdoor cat populations. There have been studies of the shelter data. There have been studies of um, you know, surveys from households, but never in the same place at the same time. So we put all that together and we got all sorts of great insights. Um, but the big thing we did was created a toolkit um, because it's not just about what we did here in DC. It's about taking all those tools and methods and sharing them with, with folks. So we've developed um, with the DC Cat Count, um, all the, the different organizations that are involved, Humane Rescue Alliance in DC here, um, has been a great leader in this project, ASPCA, um, you know, all of the funders, our scientists um, put together this great toolkit. So you can look at this, you can read it. It's like taking a, a course and you can learn how to do all of this. Um, mm. As well as, you know, it'll point out like when you might need to get some expert help because I, I can't do statistics. So Danielle, is the idea that with the toolkit that other communities will be able to sort of conduct similar research and see how this these dynamics play out in their own community? Exactly. Mm-hmm. exactly. The toolkit even like sets out like how to figure out what your goals are. Mm, right. Analyzing it. So, yeah, and we're already working with some communities uh, to implement this. Um, in different uh, different levels, and we'll continue working with more so we can refine it and figure out, you know, where are the kinks in the process? What what um, what may be different in a different community than it was in DC? And we can re- refine the tool. We can learn from each other. Mm-hmm. People out there who are doing it can help um, other help mentor other communities. Without without giving too much away, I mean, it sounds like you're kind of in the preliminary stages of doing work in other communities. But are you seeing like do do so far from what you're seeing? Does DC sort of echo what you see in other places, or is it really different from one community to the other? Because I was I was trying to think about like the, what are the dynamics that impact the number of outdoor cats? I mean, there's all sorts of things. It can be weather. It can be you know what's the shelter's intake policy? Do they even take in stray cats and things like that? Because mm-hmm. all of those things. Can be variables. So I was curious, like, what are you seeing so far? Is there big differences, little differences? Yeah, I, I anticipate that we'll see trends as far as where outdoor cats are in relation to socioeconomic factors mm, interesting. Uh, and um, land density. Um, how, mm-hmm. like, what, what does the landscape look like? Um, and one thing that we saw in DC, which I'm pretty excited about because it was often a point of contention is that we didn't see the cats in like the big green spaces. Um, Folks who might be familiar with DC, we have like Rock Creek Park, which is a national park service property, um, wooded. It's, it's, uh, it's like in the middle of the city, but it's, um, it's kind of wilderness area, Mm -hmm. but there aren't a lot of cats there. We see cats where people are Mm, necessarily in kind of wild areas. Yeah. So we anticipate we'll see these kind of trends. Um, we'll see uh, more outdoor cats in areas um, with lower socioeconomic resources, um, areas that um, traditionally haven't been um, as well resourced, don't have capacity, um, getting services and other factors that may lead to those cats being outdoors. Mm. But those kind of things also um inspire a lot of other questions that we can dive deeper into and understanding that relationship between people and cats and what what the role of the shelter and and cat rescue groups and how like what we can do to help um, not just the cats but the people who care for them. Right. And it seems like one of the, I mean, I know you alluded to this earlier, but but talking about, you know, cat advocates and bird advocates and the fact that they're sometimes seen to be sort of at, at odds. But I mean, this is sort of a program where the data can potentially help both cats and birds. Right, right. You know, we talk a lot about efforts like trap, neuter, return, where the cats are, are captured, they're sterilized and vaccinated and they're returned to where they came from uh, as being a successful program. But what what does that mean? Like, mm. um, what intensity are you doing that? How many cats are getting sterilized? And one of the the big interests for me in this kind of work is to be able to gauge your own own program. Like, what am I doing as a person running a program, um, doing TNR? Do I need to do more? Do I need to shift it in different areas? What can it tell me about how me and my group is doing TNR and how mm. can we get more effective? And then I can have data to show other people how it's working. Um, so it's it's both um, great for internal efforts, for shelters, for community cat groups, 
um, for individuals who are doing this work as well as for um, the broader community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's wonderful to see how this data can then inform, I'm sure, the the very, very long-standing debate of how to work with cat management, you know, especially mm -hmm. for strays that are out there. Um, and it's great to see that this could inform a lot of uh, agencies that are looking to help focus their resources from one place to mm -hmm. another, especially with a cat count like this. So I'm curious, I know that it probably goes more into the report about it. And you mentioned it a little bit, but the cats, so they were segmented of how you commented or uh, uh, counted them, right? So there was indoor cats with households that you counted. And then how did you do the, the outdoor? Is it like outdoor community cats? And then also strays that aren't uh, helped by the communities? How, how were they, how did you segment that? And then how did you deal with the unimaginable task of like not counting them quite twice through all the pictures that you took. Like, I don't know even how, you, how to begin with something like that. They wear name tags, Austin. Yeah. Like each yeah. Tag, oh, it's no. a little, hello, my name is <laughs> sticker. Yeah. I'm Bert. I'm guessing it's not that. Garfield. Yeah. Anyway. yeah. <laughs> well, they kind of do though. I mean, but it's not like the sticker, but it's just like, what are those identifying factors of a particular cat? So a lot of mm -hmm. it right now with it was, and thank, thank you to all the researchers who are involved in this is, looking at the images and saying, is that the same cat? Um, and you would know, like if you have a camera set at one location for a week, that you're probably going to get that cat more than once. So mm -hmm. you can figure out which cats there are. Um, and this is an area where, um, you know, there's been a lot of technological advancement in looking at this for like tigers and other species that how do you identify um, them by their markings? And, and there's a future of, of that kind of facial recognition Mm -hmm. um, to be applied to this. And they're, you know, they're using that kind of facial recognition um, for lost animals and people who are looking for their like lost cats and dogs. So, um, you know, it's, there's a lot of technology and innovation in this that's really helped. Um, so it's not always going to be just looking through images um, and making your eyes, you think Zoom fatigue is bad, right? Like <laughs> ad identification <laughs> fatigue, right? Uh I can just imagine that 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 software, the facial, that'll really help with all the cats who are out there robbing banks. I mean, yeah, that's a yeah, that's a major yeah. growing issue. I mean, especially like just ask McGruff, the crime fighting dog. You know, like the cats mm -hmm. robbing banks issue is a real problem with the whole facial recognition stuff. Yeah, especially because they're they're so short, they usually avoid the camera. right. Exactly, they don't show up on the camera. All of a sudden, <laughs> your bank is empty, and you have no idea why. Yeah, that height marker doesn't really help because they're all about the same height. In all seriousness, I was wondering, you mentioned earlier that um, one of the findings I thought, and stop me if I'm wrong, was it sounded like you were saying that um, that it, the general findings indicated that the cats are not in the sort of D.C. green and wilderness spaces for the most part, and they're closer to humans. Is, was that a surprise to the researchers? Did they expect to find otherwise? or does, And what is what are the sort of implications of that finding? Uh, I think that that there may be a few people that were surprised by mm -hmm. that. Um, I wasn't surprised by that. Mm -hmm. I live in DC and have done a lot of, of work here. Um, but, you know, cats, these cats are really dependent on, on people for food. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what we see. That's why we have people that are out there caring for these, these groups of cats. Um, and the cats will, they're smart. They'll figure out where there's food um, and, and kind of stick around there. I mean, the cats aren't, you know, there's been research on, you know, comparing some dog and cat behavior and, and dogs are more interested in working. What they found is cats, they don't want to have a job. Like they are not interested in working hard to get the resources. They're, you know, find the dish of food, they're going to eat from that, right? Um, and so that's why we see these cats. And, and we also find that there are a lot of these cats that do go in and out of homes. Mm. Um, and this goes to what you were asking earlier, Carrie, about the differentiation. And we, we did surveys of of households and asked questions about, you know, whether people are, are feeding cats. Um, so it was really a, a combination of, of your traditional ownership, as well as people who might be caretakers of, of mm. outdoor cats and community cats. Um, and you see, there's really this, this kind of blurry line. There's not like black and white of cats that are owned and cats that aren't owned. There's this really um, gray mm. region of this. And I think that's a really interesting area that could use a lot more um, understanding so that we 
know how to provide the resources and who are providing them to. Yeah, I was going to ask this gray area thing. It seems like, you know, this would come into the issues of even how we're describing these animals. Like I, I was, you know, like, is this a stray cat? Is this a quote community cat? Is this an outdoor cat? Is this a feral cat? Like you hear all these different terms and people tend to use them interchangeably, but I don't know that they really are interchangeable in a lot of cases. And so I'm wondering if you have some sort of guidelines for people around like, when should they be saying like, when is a cat? I mean, stray technically, you know, people will say that's a stray cat, but Stray really means that that is a cat who is, you know, has a home and has escaped from that home or gotten out somehow like like, but that's not how people necessarily are using that term. And do you guys talk about these sort of how you're how are you using language and things like that? Yes, I have a group of uh, other um, cat experts and Mm -hmm. cat wonks, as we might (laughs) say out there, um, who we've been having these conversations um, and continue to have these conversations about this language that we that we use. And one of the the things that I would like to see is is to reduce the use of the word feral for these. Mm. It's it's become interchangeable with cats that are outdoors, mm-hmm. and that's not really accurate. Um, you know, we often may hear a term called like friendly feral, which mm. is see more on that like just doesn't. <laughs> right. it, it makes it really confusing when you're talking to people who may be using that term differently like what does that really mean like a stray cat is a cat that's strayed off his property um a a community cat i was the term that our field came up with this kind of this broad term mainly because it's so hard to define these these cats like i don't know if i see a cat outside do i know whether that cat belongs to someone or doesn't belong to someone do i know if that cat um, has a home? Does that cat need help? Like, I don't know what that cat situation is just by looking at it. Right. Um, I don't know if that cat's social with people. I mean, they may, I mean, you know, you go to your friend's house and they have a very social cat that runs away from you as soon as you walk in the door. Right. Is that cat feral because he ran away from you? Probably not. Um, so if a cat outdoors runs away from you is why we say that cat would be feral then, or is that cat just you know, wanting to do his own thing. So yeah, it's, it's really hard to have these, um, have these terms out there. So I like, if a cat's outdoors, that's an outdoor cat, right? That's where the free roaming is another common term that just means a cat's out there wandering around. Um, But yeah, when we get into things like ownership and behavior that has to do with like feral or Mm. not feral, um, those are a little, little trickier. So basically we should avoid like calling things feral unless we're talking about you know Oof. ourselves having gone nuts in, in, uh, yeah. in lockdown <laughs> I'm really I'm really to, feral at this point truly <laughs> reverted to a wild state so you might find like in areas that you find cats in in really remote <laughs> wilderness areas those cats are more feral like mm-hmm. yeah not relying on people for food is, is more of a true feral interesting a social with people but the cat that you know comes up to the person who feeds them every day and rubs up against their legs, maybe not let them touch them. Isn't, isn't quite so feral. Right. Or Carrie's dog floof being woken up on a Monday morning too early. Feral. (laughs) Or if I stick my finger in his yurt, (laughs) does not like it when I put my finger into his little hut that I bought him during and he goes, it's a little scary. That's like a no knock warrant there. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's a great, that is a perfect description. That is yeah. exactly how he treats it uh, appropriately. Yeah. No, no warning, no warning. Well, mm-hmm. we've been uh, kind of walking around this topic of indoor versus outdoor. Um, I think we know more about indoor, I feel like, than outdoor. So can uh, I'm, I'm curious, you know, when we see a cat outdoors, it's a common question. How do I know if this cat needs help? Do I leave it alone? What can we, can we talk a little bit about cats outdoors what what i do if i see one do i feed one what implications does that have etc yeah yeah that's a really great question and it's it's the kind of thing that people face all the time um whether you you know have any interaction with cats you know anything about cats you have cats at home like everyone can see a cat outside um so what do you do i don't if it's you know if the cats in your neighborhood the first thing i would say is like you want to be kind of like a pet detective you know, does that cat have a family nearby? Is someone um, feeding that cat? So 
start asking around, ask questions, put your detective hat on, ask your neighbors, ask the kids in the neighborhood because they always know what's going on. They know who's feeding cats or where cats hang out and they mm-hmm. know the cat's name. You know, kids know a lot. Like, But just, you know, ask people in your community. Um, the thing you can do is you can you can fashion like a, a little paper collar for the cat, like paper masking tape and write on it. Is this your cat? I want to help. Please call me. You know, like whatever message, just put that on when that cat goes home. You know, if, if a person sees that and reads it, you know, they can call you. They can, you know, sometimes they may take it off. You might have to try a few times. But if a cat's, if you see a cat regularly and the cat is 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 social and, and will come up to you, you can you can do that. Um, Especially if you see that cat robbing a bank. I mean, yes. if you see that cat robbing a bank, you can put the little paper collar saying, I saw this cat robbing a bank. Please get yeah. back to me. The police well, want to speak I want with my- you. I want my pounce, right? right? I, I want, want my, my cut. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then you can also p- post up like wanted signs, right? Like yeah. you know, go back to the the old school. It's just like, you know, make a poster, put the That's right. face yeah. on it, wanted, you know. Um, Perfect. Share those, you know, old school on the, the telephone poles or light posts, whatever you have on your street. But then on like your social media, like a lot of people are on next door or they maybe have like a neighborhood listserv. It's like, you know, however people in your community are sharing information, like put that out there. Mm-hmm. Because if that cat is a, is a usual, um, someone knows. Um, I see that a lot in next door in my community. It's like people can tell you that cat's whole backstory. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they know a lot. So it's a great way. So first, like try to find out if someone else is feeding that cat, they're, you know, it's their, the cat's covered, that cat's good. Uh, Maybe that cat is lost and you've, you've been able to reunite the cat. That's great. Um, You can call your local animal shelter and you can file a report saying, you know, I found this cat. Um, Is someone missing this cat? Um, A lot of times um, you can get uh, a cat, if you can collect the cat and get the cat, um, to like a vet clinic or the shelter, they can scan for the mi- a microchip. Mm. Uh, but one of the things we want to think about is is really changing the way we think about the role of the shelter in here. It used to mm. be you see a cat outside, he needs help. Let's just bring him to the shelter and the shelter can deal with it. Well, our shelters are getting full of cats. And we found that bringing those cats to the shelter doesn't help them get back to their families. Mm-hmm. You look nationally at the what we think of as like return to owner rates for, for stray cats. And it's usually like around like four or 5%. That's like, yeah, that's like nothing. Uh, So when we take those cats out of the community where they live, they're less likely to get back home. Mm -hmm. And we see that even more in certain, um, certain um, areas, certain communities that um, are traditionally underserved and may have, um, don't have that same kind of um, uh, relationship with their animal shelter. They may not um, think of it as a resource, be aware of it. Um, they may not uh, trust the the law enforcement. Um, so, you know, the, there's going to be a disproportionate impact in some mm-hmm. areas. But um, as a as a person in the community, you're in a much better position to help that cat get back home, if unless the cat goes back home on their own. Mm-hmm. Um, but then the other thing, if if you, you know, you can't find the owner, if the cat's still sticking around, you can think about, well, what does the cat need? What can I do to help the cat? And that's where you can participate in uh, community cat efforts. Um, find uh, with your shelter, if there's a community cat program, a TNR program in your, in your community, um, and help get that cat to the vet, get the cat spayed or neutered and vaccinated and, and brought back to the community, because that's going to help that cat the most is making sure that that cat gets that vet care. Wonderful. These are all things that people can do in the community. Um, They can be part of the solution. It's not Mm. thing that uh, we want all of our, our shelters or other agencies to do. We, you know, it's a community We're we're all part of it. We can help. We can make a difference. You can make a difference for cats. Love that. I I feel like we should see the NBC after school special. Like the the rainbow, the more you know. (laughs) Sounds by the ages, you guys. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, that is great. Give, you know, spreading the wealth and, and you know, you could take ownership over this and, and really help uh, alleviate some of the resource burdens that, that mm. the agencies have, local agencies have. So I think that that's a great um, option. And thank you for giving those actionable steps. Because I think 
you know, the, the resources and the education is, is, uh, is really important for people to know in the neighborhood. So what about the cats that are jealous from the other end of the glass on the inside of the house? They're like, Hey, they get to go outside and see all these things. Like I want to, I want to, you know, be a part of that. So yeah. what, what do you think about indoor cats? How, how, how do we deal with them? Yeah, the and that's, that's a great, a great question. Cause we talk a lot about the outdoor cats and how to make life better for them. But, you know, when you have, have your own cats, I really encourage you to keep those cats confined, keep those cats indoors. Um, we have enough of a challenge with the, the cats that are already outdoors. Um, but, you know, when we have cats that are, that are indoors and I, I really struggle again, this is terminology, like what's a better term than saying indoors. Cause I'm like, my cats aren't fully indoors because they have a catio. Mm. They can go through, they go, they have a little cat door and they go out and they have a big outdoor enclosure. Um, so they're not roaming, but they have some outdoor space at time. They can, um, they can smell the grass. They can mm. see the birds at a distance. Um, they can get some more exercise uh, running around out there. Um, and it's a great way to give cats that outdoor experience in a safe way. We um, totally need a new term here. I mean, like, because yeah. confined doesn't sound good and like, you know, but indoor isn't accurate and we got to brainstorm on this. Like, what's a good <laughs> term for the cat that's living the sort of luxurious life with a, <laughs> with a sort of, you know, an estate that it can explore. <laughs> well, and they, and they also, they don't need, right. and it's They're my glamping. cats, my cats are spoiled. <laughs> they have a very large catio, mostly because I convinced my friends and neighbors to come and help me build it um ourselves um it probably wouldn't pass any building codes but (laughs) (laughs) um but you can also have like much smaller ones you know even like the things kind of like boxes that come out of a window just and then there's this growing movement of of cats who adventure cats that you know walk on a, a leash and go backpacking and boating and do all these things that traditionally we think of as dog activities but there are like a lot bank of, robbing, for example, bank, bank robbing, robbing. Being one of those traditional activities. Yeah. Yes. I mean, cats are probably better thieves than dogs too, because I, I would think so. Dogs just like, I would think they would be very bad thieves. They're two dogs. Yes. I mean, yeah. I, there's a cat on my block that regularly steals lunches from the elementary school. Oh my God. You'd think the dogs would be like trying to learn from that cat. Like, I know business. you see yeah. him like walking down the street with a little um, paper bag in his mouth. Right. And giving Ted talks to the dogs on how to pull that, pull that off. Right. Well, he doesn't want to share, right? <laughs> but, but yeah, there's so many ways that we can help enrich our, our cats lives and, um, and kind of shake up this old idea of like, well, cats are easy pets. You know, they don't mm. know how to work. It's like, no, they, they really, they like that kind of enrichment and, and engagement and different experiences. And you can, you can have that same kind of bond with them of, of doing things. Um, maybe not like me when I have five cats, I can't take them all out for a walk together. That would be a little weird. I'd like to see that. Um, yeah, I would please. like I to see that. If you ever do that, please make sure the pod is there yeah. so that we can film it. You know, things like that, it it helps when you start when the cats are young like mm. kittens and get them used to things. So, you know, maybe then my next generation of, of cats, I will all start with that. But, um, you know, there's just there's so many things that we can do even with, um, you know, if say, for example, you have a cat that likes to go outside that like runs out the door, um, you know, not only can you provide that cat like a catio if they have outdoor space, but you could do things like clicker training to help change that cat's behavior. So he's not rushing the door. Mm. It's the same thing. Like when you try to teach your dog and I say, try teach your dog not to jump on people when they come over I and mean, you can try whether you're successful or not. I, you know, I won't, <laughs> I won't admonish you for that, but you know um, you can, you can do those same kind of things with cats um, and kind of really stimulate their mind and, and give them something to do and, and help, develop that bond with the, the mm. cat. 
Danielle, how do you go about, like, if somebody's a bit used to sort of keep it, letting their cat sort of go outdoors, but wants to kind of transition them to either, you know, being purely indoors or having, you know, a catio space, like, are there sort of techniques you can use to sort of accustom a cat who really thinks he wants to be out exploring the world, <laughs> dodging traffic, killing birds, like, you know, like, what can we have do to help the cats sort of recognize that they're safer indoors? Yeah. Yeah. And I think part of it is, is recognizing what, how you want to provide that enrichment mm-hmm. cat, um, you know, say you have ability to, to build some sort of outdoor catio, um, but not everyone, everyone does. Mm-hmm. Um, fortunately, folks will run into problems with like homeowners associations that have weird restrictions because they never thought catio should be part of the home design. Um, but you know, those are opportunities when you can start teaching your cat how to walk on a leash, especially if the cat's comfortable already being outside, getting them comfortable wearing a harness, you know, something, you know, collars aren't really good to walk cats. You want a harness, something that's going to be sturdy that they can't slip out of, um, get the cat used to that and on the leash. And then you can go outside. You can go for walks where the cat um, is already used to going, Mm. Uh, but it's, it's really just ways that you and your cat can engage together. One of the cool things that uh, went over swimmingly just about two weeks ago, our friends came over with their cat and we have a little, we're just living in a little apartment. So we can't do too much with our, with our like patio area, but we just got a magnetic screen so you would ha- you have to pull it open in order to do it. But for cats who don't know how to do that, they loved just sitting out on the inside, looking out of the screen because they could smell the air. They were just sniffing the air, looking at all the, the birds that were around. So it was kind of like an open window with a screen in or something mm. like that. But it was just they loved it. And I feel like that was a, a, a taste of enrichment. I don't know if that's, that's a great example. Yeah. yeah. Well, we think of like, we're humans. We're so visual. Like our, our sight is, is such a strong sense for cats. It's not as much as that, you know, smell, mm. even hearing. So having that kind of like open window, like that's a whole new world. Got it. Super cool. Well, I, I'm excited. I think we have a lot of uh, cool, actionable ways for either your indoor or your outdoor cat to uh, feel welcomed and enriched. Uh, Danielle, was there anything else that you wanted to talk about either, you know, this topic here, the DC cat count or anything else that you wanted to wrap up on? I know that we'll, we'll have some links to the, to the study and stuff, but I think this is a great discussion. Yeah. I said the thing I'd like to add is that when, you know, we talk about keeping our cats, um, you know, safe indoors, or we talk about outdoor cats where our our goal is really to reduce those numbers. It's not only good for the cats, but that's part of it is because we also are interested in in protecting the wildlife. That's mm-hmm. out um, and it's just our way of doing this. Um, so, you know, if you're if you can modify your cat's behavior um, or the next cat you get. Um, think about those things proactively. Um, and then the, you know, the cats outdoors, just, you know, reducing that population is going to help our wild neighbors and our, our wild friends out there. Um, and I like to think about that as it's, you know, it's not necessarily about the population of birds that cats may or may not impact, but even that individual bird that, you know, we all, we all love animals and we know from a cat's perspective, catching and killing a bird may, you know, not be an ethical dilemma for them. Um, but to us, like that's, you know, that's still heartbreak to see mm-hmm. that yeah. and, you know, how we can help prevent those things. So, um, and yeah. So- and in, in a way that makes life more fun for the cat too, which is great. Right. It's really a sort of a win-win scenario. If you can set up these good engaging enrichment techniques. Right. Yeah. It's fun. Fun with cats. Mm-hmm. Fun. Love it. <laughs> Fun with cats. It was now. A if fun- you can actually propose to me a way that I, as someone who is allergic to cats but really loves them, can have a cat without having to have a large series of needles thrust into my body, that would be an well, excellent me- next step for me. There, I will tell you, there has been developed a cat food <gasps> that helps reduce the protein in cats that that is 
What do you, I have to eat the oh, cat geez. food? No. Oh, the cat eats the cat food. The okay, cat eats God. the cat food. There might be more game Very. for this. All right. And it All reduces right. that. That's there's a, a particular protein that they produce that's then that sheds Interesting. the dander that triggers. That's the what typically triggers human allergies to cat. Oh, cool. And this has has been shown to reduce that. I can't I'm wait to taste it. I'm very interested. It's, I hope it's, it's made by, yeah. by Purina. I don't you know. That the, wow, interesting. It's, uh, yeah. So. Is it on the market already? It's on the market. Oh, yeah. I'm going to go investigate this. I can't very remember what it's called, but it's, I know, you can Google it. Hmm. So, so next time we have you on, I may have a cat. Yeah, there you go. And not have had to have a bunch of injections to have that cat, yeah. which would be <laughs> really critical have for update. me. Yeah. She'll have an update. <laughs> Warren, Warren Floof. <laughs> 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 The feral standoff begins. No, just kidding. Um, All right, Danielle, thank you so much. Danielle Bays, Senior Analyst for Cat Protection and Policy at the Humane Society of the United States. Always a pleasure to have you on. Thank you again for catching us up with what you've been up to. Really appreciate it. It was cat-tastic. Hey, that's a perfect way to end this show. Um, That's all we have for today's show. For more helpful cat tips and advice, you know where to find us, humanesociety.org. Thanks again for tuning in, and we will see you next time on Humane Voices.